is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to The World Today, live from CGTN in London. I'm Stephen Cole, our top stories. High tensions and high level talks, thorny issues on the agenda. As a senior U.S. diplomat arrives in China, the first face to face high level meetings in months. Typhoon Infa hits China's east coast just days after floods devastated the country. Gold glory as China's medal count continues to grow, claiming wins in weightlifting and synchronized diving. A mosque, a temple, and a thousand-year-old bridge, new recognition for ancient treasures as China's Quanzhou City joins the UNESCO World Heritage List. But first, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman has arrived in China for talks with the country's foreign minister, Wang Yi, the first face-to-face -face high-ranking contact between Washington and Beijing in months. Ahead of the trip, Washington said it welcomes competition, but there was need to be a head level playing field and guardrails to avoid conflict. In response, Beijing warned it won't accept Washington taking a superior position. Yang Shansan reports from Tianjin. Six months into U.S. President Joe Biden's reign at the White House, and China and the U.S. are having another go improving their relations. After years of disputes over issues such as trade, tech, and human rights, but why this port city on China's northeast coast? Oh, I think the the reason I I believe is because of the pandemic. Um, we we don't have any foreign actually we don't have any uh, foreign official visit to Beijing in recent months because of the uh, need to control the pandemic. China is the last stop on the overseas trip, which has already taken the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State to Japan, South Korea, and Mongolia. Ahead of Wendy Sherman's arrival, there are signs relations aren't getting any better between Washington and Beijing. The U.S. has accused China of cyber attacks and warned China on issues related to Hong Kong. China announced it would impose sanctions on several U.S. individuals and organizations in response to sanctions placed on Chinese officials in the special administrative region. As tensions mount, experts believe the time is right for a face-to-face -face meeting, but say the sides need to respect each other's interests and find a way forward which works for both. My big expectation is U.S. should also just lay out some sort of uh, very, very basic uh, principle in handling the relations with China. For example, no intervention into the Chinese domestic politics, no intervention into the China's some sort of, uh, we say, uh, domestic affairs, just like Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and other things. Uh, I think the Biden administration want to have comp a competition with China, and uh, that could be a healthy uh, competition, or at least that could be a limited competition. Competition is different from confrontation. Um, and it's, of course, different from conflict. But we need to find out the differences, the nuance um, between the two administrations, Biden and Trump, and try to grasp, grasp the, the opportunity here. It's expected if all goes well, the Tianjin meeting will pave the way for a higher level meeting and even possibly involving two presidents. Bilateral relations are generally thought to be at the lowest level in decades, as the world's two largest economies are struggling to find a mutual understanding. But it's hoped that this meeting could be the start of a new approach. Yang Shenshan, CGTN, Tianjin. Towns evacuated, flights cancelled, cargo ships moved to safety. Typhoon Infa is battering China's east coast, packing wind speeds of 100 kilometers an hour. It arrived just days after deadly floods, had devastated large areas of the country. Wang Jiangkai reports. The highest level of emergency response has been in place in Zhejiang province since Saturday. Authorities also issued the maximum alert for storm surges and waves at sea. 
Typhoon Infa hit the island city of Zhoushan at 12.30 p.m. with wind speeds of up to 135 kilometers an hour. It was forecast to sweep through multiple regions, including Shanghai and parts of Jiangsu and Anhui provinces. Shanghai and neighboring coastal regions canceled all flights. Public transport was reduced or suspended, and businesses shuttered up. In Zhejiang's Zhoushan Island, where Infa first landed, the storm blew an anchored ship away. Emergency teams rescued the 12 crew members. Villagers were evacuated. And in the provincial capital Hangzhou, floodwaters in some areas were waist deep. Forecasters are also warning other surrounding regions, including Shandong in the east and the inland province of Henan, to prepare for the storm's effects. Wang Tianhui, CGTN. The death toll from record downpours in central China's Henan province has gone up to 63. The floods have affected more than 11 million people, destroyed thousands of homes and damaged crops. CGTN's Liu Jingjing visited a hospital in the capital, Zhengzhou. Immediately after the rain stopped, rescuers moved in to clean up. This hospital was hit hard by the downpours. Water levels on its first floor reached about two meters high. The basement and most of its supplies and equipment were not spared. Almost all large-scale medical equipment and basic medicines in the basement and on the first floor were inundated. Electricity, water, and the internet were all cut off. We could only rely on supplies and aid from the outside. Over 500 soldiers, firefighters, and emergency workers joined efforts to transfer stranded patients to other hospitals. Reconstruction began as soon as the last patient was relocated. We have worked around the clock over the past 24 hours without any rest and have helped transfer 2,700 stranded people to safe places. Our task today is to remove silt, drain water, and clean up medical and non-medical waste on each floor before the final round of disinfection. These rescue workers are also helping the hospital restock supplies and essentials to prepare for its reopening. Director Gao says their biggest challenge is the same as that of most buildings in Zhengzhou now, flood water in the basement. He says over one million cubic meters of water need to be pumped out. It's the first crucial step to the recovery process. If water is not entirely removed, power supply cannot resume. We will start pumping out wastewater from the basement tomorrow so that we can get back electricity, water, and communication. Once we have these basic necessities again, we can start providing some emergency care services again. I expect all these preparatory tasks to be done within two weeks. For those in need of medical treatment, two weeks is a relatively long wait. A number of patients count on this hospital for daily medical care. But the rescuers, young soldiers and firefighters say they are confident it can be done. Because to them, saving time is like saving lives. And every second counts. Liu Xinqing, CGTN, Zhengzhou, Henan Province. In Europe, parts of Belgium are recovering after heavy weekend rain resulted in more flash flooding. Torrents of water swept away cars in the streets of Dinant, catching many residents by surprise. Properties were inundated, roads, paving and vehicles destroyed, and mounds of debris left behind. The French-speaking region of Wallonia was hit hardest by the new deluge, two weeks after floods claimed 37 lives in the country. Germany had already been devastated by the worst flooding in almost 60 years when more storms arrived. Emergency units in North Rhine-Westphalia and Bavaria are on high alert, with heavy rain expected to continue. But financial help is arriving from an unexpected source, as Natalie Carney reports. Another truck full of generous donations from the public for those struck by deadly floods earlier this month. Sebastian Frenkel, who lives in another part of the country, initiated a crowdfunding campaign when he heard about the devastation. He managed to raise more than 30,000 euros. We are unloading everything now. We have brought emergency power generators, construction dryers, screed dryers. We have things for the children in a different car, and we hope people will benefit from it. 
The full scale of the economic damage is still being assessed. Deutsche Bahn, which operates the country's train network, says rebuilding the roads and rails affected is likely to run close to 1.3 billion euros. Private businesses are also counting the costs. The rolling vineyards of the Ara Valley were among the most seriously affected by the flooding. The area's Maishos Oltena Wine Cooperative has over 460 members, many of whom have lost both their homes and their livelihoods in the floods. Experts are blaming on climate change. I can't give any figures or even dimensions. In any case, it is devastatingly threatening to the existence of our business. That has to be said quite clearly. The barrels that were still in the cellar, where there was actually wine in them, are probably no longer usable. We're now trying to save what can be saved. Fingers are now being pointed and tough questions are being asked about both Germany's preparedness and emergency warning system, which many of the victims argue was in no way sufficient to protect property and save lives. First the fire brigade came and said please leave buildings within a distance of 50 meters from the R or go into the upper levels. And then about 10 minutes later, if I'm not mistaken, there was a short siren alarm. I also briefly heard church bells. Then it was over. There was a deathly silence. It was spooky, like in a horror film. Since, the federal government has been working to ensure that horror film is never experienced again. Following much criticism, much of which has been directed towards Berlin, Interior Minister Horst Seehofer has announced the introduction of a text messaging warning system for emergencies, a service that has existed here in Germany for several decades, but has not been in use due to privacy concerns. This warning system, already in use in several other countries, will now make it possible to send out emergency SMS text messages to all mobile network users in a defined area of concern without needing to know personal phone numbers. The text alerts, once operational in the next 12 to 18 months, will supplement other methods of issuing warnings across the country, such as sirens, smartphone apps and radio bulletins. Natalie Carney, CGTN, Munich. China tops the Olympics medal table with six gold, one silver and four bronze medals. Both Li Fabin and Chen Lijun claim victory in weightlifting, while Shi Ting Mao and Wang Han took first place in the women's synchronized three-meter springboard diving event. Dan Williams has more from Tokyo. There are 18 gold medals up for grabs on day two of the Tokyo Olympics. And after a golden, treble golden success on day one for China, there was more gold success on day two. And that included in the diving in the women's three-meter synchronized springboard, shooting Mao and Wang Han uh, winning gold. That's the fifth time in a row that China has won that event. It's also Xu's third Olympic gold medal. There was also, of course, uh, it, it keeps alive the potential of a possible clean sweep of gold medals for the China team in the diving. Remember, Rio 2016, China came away with seven out of a possible eight. There was also uh, success for China in the weightlifting. Li Fabin winning gold in the men's 61 kilograms, uh, lifting a total of 313 kilograms. That's a new Olympic record. Uh, and at one point, he stood on one leg during one of his attempts. There were also medals for China in the shooting. Uh, Sheng Li Hao winning silver, Yang Hao Yan winning bronze in the men's 10 meter air rifle, uh, while Jiang Ranxin won bronze in the women's 10 meter air rifle as well. Elsewhere, Japan's Naomi Osaka is through now to the second round of the women's uh, tennis singles. Ashley Barty, though, the Australian world number one, she is out. Uh, and there was also some spectacular sport on offer, uh, really amazing images uh, from both the skateboarding and the surfing, which, of course, is making its Olympic debut. Dan Williams, CGTN, Tokyo. We're still to come here on The World Today. Insects make a beeline for wildflower restoration efforts at UK farms.
the EU's digital COVID certificate, which offers the promise of unlocking hassle-free travel around Europe this summer. In less than two weeks' time, the Czech border will also open to all EU and Serbian citizens. 4.4 million Hungarians received their first dose of COVID vaccine. 18 and over can receive a COVID-19 vaccination, but it does come with conditions. Third wave will probably take longer to emerge. This vaccination centre is part of a massive effort to try and drive down the numbers of the new variant that was first identified in India. Welcome back. A reminder of our top stories. Thorny issues on the agenda as a senior U.S. diplomat arrives in China for the first face-to-face high-level talks in months. Typhoon Infa hits China's east coast for days after floods devastated the country. Gold glory as China's medal count continues to grow, claiming wins in weightlifting and synchronized diving. According to two new reports, British taxpayers will bear the costs of COVID for decades to come. Government debt is now more than $3 trillion. That's 99.7% of GDP. The Public Accounts Committee, made up of UK lawmakers, says the crisis has exposed people to what they call significant financial risks. For more, Yolo Abdavid joins me now. Um, Yolo, these are eye-watering figures. And that's quoting the chairperson of the committee, the Public Accounts Committee, who said, uh, Dame Meghilia, that these are eye-watering sums of money and this is what the cost of COVID, in terms of COVID measures taken by the UK government, this is what it cost. Now, you've already quoted some of the figures, uh, but the, the most staggering of all is that so far, the spent up to May is $511 billion. That's already two months out of date. And some of the examples of where the money has gone uh, is also equally staggering in terms of 36 billion worth of bad um, loans ha- out of a total of 126 billion dollars have been given out. That is, these, ha- these loans, loans have to be written off. So the, the danger, according to this committee, which is made of uh, cross-party lawmakers from both sides of the political divides, most of them actually from the ruling party and from the government's own party, is that this, it, it creates a serious risk for taxpayers' money with finances for the foreseeable future. And that's why uh, they're, they're, drawing, they're making such an impact in terms of this report. And they also wanted to draw attention to the PPE, the, the personal protective clothing, which we heard so much about last year, that there's been an absolute amount of wastage. Uh, and they quote, again, staggering figures, which they say is unacceptably high in terms of the amount of money that's been spent. And now it costs around $9 million a week to keep, to keep these debts in place and to keep uh, w- what they've keep already the bought payments, and to try and keep up with the payments. Exactly. And despite being in the midst of a pandemic, the government is considering opening up uh, sporting stadia uh, to, to big events. Uh, but uh, on conditions? Yes, they're discussing it. Uh, and this follows on from Freedom Day, if you remember, uh, last Monday when the, the government wanted to open up, even though at that time uh, the infection rates were going up. Now they're talking about potentially that only people who have been double vaccinated, people who have had both jabs, are allowed to go into sporting stadiums. They're mostly talking about football. Uh, and the Premier League games, but they're also talking about possibly concerts and other events too. It's in discussion. They're not denying it that they're discussing it. It will be hugely unpopular with many, many people if it does go ahead, especially because on behalf of the Football Supporters Association, there's concern for the smaller clubs that it will throw supporters away from the game rather than entice them back at a time when obviously their finances are in, in dire straits. 
And also, there is question from opposition uh, uh, politicians questioning, well, it's not about stopping people coming in, it actually should be about better testing of people to see whether the virus is still being shared and spread about. You know, it's persuading people to get jabbed. Uh, Yolo, many thanks indeed. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has condemned the thousands of people who took part in an anti-lockdown protest in Sydney and other cities as reckless and selfish. Authorities are urging protesters to isolate and get tested amid fears the protest could become super spreader events. Sydney's four-week lockdown is expected to be extended beyond the end of the month as infection levels continue to go up, driven by the highly contagious Delta variant. More than 100 people have died in floods and landslides in India. Scores of people were killed in the state of Maharashtra, where a series of landslides destroyed villages south of Mumbai. Rescuers are still looking for survivors with dozens of people unaccounted for. India's western coast has suffered days of torrential rain, with more downpours expected in the next few days. The nighttime streets of many Afghan cities have fallen quiet after the government imposed a month-long curfew covering most of the country in an attempt to halt advancing Taliban forces. No movement is allowed between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. local time to try and prevent the militant group invading cities. Taliban fighters are thought to have taken control of large areas of the country within weeks of the U.S. withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. The Chinese harbour city of Guangzhou has been included on UNESCO's World Heritage List in recognition of its historical importance. The port was a global trading hub that became the start of the maritime sink road. Chen Tong visits Guangzhou to explore its rich and unique history. Wind and sea. Quanzhou in southern Fujian province has clear advantages when it comes to trade. Quanzhou is a coastal city. More than 1,000 years ago, it developed quickly as a port city to come the starting point on the maritime Silk Road. And here, Xihu Port welcomes cargo from all over the world. Foreign cargo came to China via Quanzhou, while Chinese products also went overseas via the port city. So it's a great location that long been home to Chinese culture and foreign ones. You could say Quanzhou is where world's cultures meet. While well, Quanzhou's architecture was constructed through the riches of Mingnan, or southern Fujian culture, you will also find corners with external elements in the city. And now, with Quanzhou's successful inclusion onto the World Heritage List, China's total natural and cultural heritage sites total 56. Chen Tong, CGTN, Quanzhou, Fujian Province. Conservationists are quite literally buzzing with hope that nature-friendly farming can help restore wildlife habitats for bees and insects. Up to 97% of UK wildflower meadows have been lost in recent decades, largely because of intensive farming, pollution and urbanisation. The loss of habitat has had an impact on several species, but bees are especially impacted. Kitty Logan reports. An English wildflower meadow, part of a traditional landscape, native flowers hidden in long grass. A busy hub of biodiversity too, with butterflies, grasshoppers, beetles and much more. But these areas are scarce. Conservationists estimate the majority of UK wildflower meadows were lost in recent decades. The World Wildlife Fund says it's concerned. Partly because they have their own intrinsic value and are critically important for a whole range of wildlife. But also because they are a mirror on what is happening more broadly across all types of habitat and our, our mismanagement of nature. In the past, farmers were pressured to maximize production, aerial spraying this valley with pesticides. But when organic farmers took over the land, they transformed it, allowing wildflowers to evolve. The valley is now alive with oxeye daisies and ladies' bed straw, spotted moths on blue scabious flowers, and bee numbers boosted, contributing to nature's cycle. So more insect life, more pollination, more insect life, more songbird life, because they love the insects. More songbird life, more birds of prey. For some bee species, it's already too late. Many gone for good. The main reason that pollinators like bees have declined is, is just there aren't enough flowers in the modern world. We've created a, a kind of landscape that's almost completely devoid of flowers, in fact. And if you're a bee, that's your only source of food. Conservationists want to restore more areas like this. 
A hundred flower types can grow in one field. The more variety, the more insects. But while many enjoy wildflowers, modern farming can be detrimental. Chemicals wiping flowers from crop fields. But those crops need insects to pollinate them too. We need to find a balance, but we've gone way too far in, in the wrong direction. And there are many, many farms with almost no biodiversity left at all. And that isn't sustainable in the long term. We need insects. There are now schemes to encourage nature-friendly farming, leaving flowers growing wild in some fields, these foxgloves proving perfect for bees. Carefully conserved wildfire fields like this one are full of life and colour. But these are isolated pockets. In many other places, the species that thrive right here are struggling. Roadside flowers help connect these pockets. Increasingly, authorities like Highways England let grass verges grow, allowing nature to flourish. So you form corridors of good habitat to allow animals, you know, with birds, mammals, insects, to move between these islands and gradually their populations will recover. Every small area helps. Flowers filter pollution and sequest carbon, doing their bit for climate change. Some flower fields are planted intentionally too, brightening up prospects for nature, creating colour and a bee sanctuary. And when chemicals can be avoided, the difference is clear, allowing nature to recover and flowers to grow and grow. Kitty Logan, CDTN, Oxfordshire. Coming up next, CGTN Europe's flagship science and technology show. This week, Razor features a project to study cancer by sending mini organoids to the Chinese space station and looks to the heavens with the James Webb telescope. Launching later this year, it'll study the cosmos, gazing 1.5 million kilometers into space, searching for the earliest galaxies and proof of life on exoplanets. That's Razor right after the world today at 16.30 GMT here on CGTN. But that's it from the world today. From me, Stephen Cole, thanks for watching. We're available on smart TV apps such as Rocco, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. You can also find us on YouTube and Daily Motion, as well, of course, at CGTN.com and on the CGTN app. From all the team here in London, goodbye.